you women, since you've got rights have done nothing, nothing but sleep about, cheat, oh God. ruin lives. I'm not going to have sex with my wife. I'll go with a few bar flies. Nice legs, nice body. That really annoyed me, actually. The more that I've sat with it, the more it's festering. Based on the best-selling novel by Margaret Atwood, this series is set in Gilead, a totalitarian society in what used to be part of the United States. Guys with machine guns just, just started shooting from the gallery seats. It just, just happened. Jesus. Gilead is ruled by a fundamentalist regime that treats women as property of the state and is faced with environmental disasters and a plummeting birth rate. In a desperate attempt to repopulate a devastated world, a few remaining fertile women are forced into sexual servitude. You girls will serve the leaders of the faithful and their barren wives. You will bear children for them. Oh, you are so lucky! One of these women, Offred, is determined to survive the terrifying world that she lives in and find the daughter that was taken from her. So that is the synopsis of The Handmaid's Tale. And we're going to be discussing that today. Starting at the very beginning, people often think that The Handmaid's Tale is some sort of period drama set in the past. It's not to do with that at all. We could try to zoom. I'd like to see you. Sure, Fred, we can zoom. See, it's the it's the way it comes across when you don't when you haven't seen it and you just see a poster. I didn't think it would be something I would like. My dad was like, "This is not. I don't want to watch this. I do not want to watch things about midwives." I was like, "It's not. It's literally not about that. It's actually really good." <laughs> you said you weren't going to be in any trouble. Yeah, I lied. <laughs> Women. We should actually put out a disclaimer that we are going to be talking about things that a lot of listeners may find distressing. So yeah. be aware of that. I read that the events in the book came from actual real life events. Everything. Everything? Wow. Everything. Well, I didn't want people saying, you're certainly a twisted, weird person. Yeah. Yeah. So instead I wanted to be able to say, I, I made nothing up. Where were women being forced to have children? Which century would you like to? <laughs> yeah. Which century would you like to visit? Which country would you like mm. to visit? Huh. Which state in the United States would you now like to visit? Which was it in the United States? When was it in the United yeah. States? Well, well, well. Any any time before Roe versus Wade. Oh, I see. So mm. some of it draws on biblical, ancient Roman law. Something kind of happened in the sixties, you know, and she's pulled all of the horror and put it in one society at one time. I don't know whether I need to read the book to fully get this, but I am still confused as to how one gets sorted into these weird categories for the women. So for the men, it seems to be that you can be a commander mm -hmm. or you can be whatever Nick is. A driver. <laughs> yeah. But he's not just a driver because he's not as high as up as Fred, but Fred made the whole thing. At one point, June goes to a village of couples that were together and had a baby and then they all went to, they, they all wore grey. You know what I mean? Is it just how rich you were or if you were married or how religious you were? Like, So in this world, very confused. you can be, you can either be a handmaid. Now, handmaids are women who I would say are in their 20s and 30s. They're one of the few women left who were fertile. So they are sexual slaves. Then you have the Marthas who can cook and clean. And they tend to be, I'm assuming, good citizens. If you're too much of a problem, whether you're fertile or infertile, you get sent to the colonies and you are pretty much doomed and you're going to die. Then you have mm -hmm. aunts who are older women. I would, But then again, I was shocked that some weren't. So maybe they're just very, very mm -hmm. religious, upholding these sort of moral standards. I see Elizabeth Moss, her character, as being very similar to many people today living in North Korea. Even though she isn't a true believer, she's kind of caught up in the rhythm of it. The handmaids are there to perform what is called the ceremony, which is honestly me watching the first episode where they explained this. I was like, oh God, this show is horrible. Um, <laughs> so they... It's actually horrific, yeah. The handmaids are there to be the oven in which the bun is put in to put it really politely um so they all gather for a prayer everyone in the household the driver oh, yes. the cook the handmaid the wife and the commander all gather to in one room then what happens the wife and the husband are looking at each other and the handmaid's just like there to be the 
tool in which they need to produce a baby. The handmaid's legs are like off the edge of the bed. The wives mm-hmm. are holding down their wrists. It's very uncomfortable. Not Nothing about the situation is romantic or passionate. Yeah. It's purely mechanical. So when you first watched it, was there anyone who stood out to you? You thought, oh my God, that would be me in this situation. Janine, I feel like I really related to her because I feel like that is how... I would eventually end up. How nice day. You know when everyone's looking at her like, okay, Ginny, why are you so happy and stuff? Because that's our coping mechanism and that's mine. Right. If she starts to think about the things that June is, what's actually going on would not cope. <laughs> and I feel like that would be me. I don't know, obviously, and I hope I never find out because I don't think she's crazy. I just think she's trying to survive and just trying to be as normal as she can be. I have a very short temper. So I did relate to Janine because it was like, yeah. oh, Okay, well, maybe I should shut up and then that's how I'll survive. That's clearly what you thought. You think you would have to learn your lessons the hard way, like Shanine did. I do say that because she is strong. She doesn't go looking for problems, but if a problem comes to her, she doesn't back down. I think I would be a bit more like Moira, sit back, store what's happening. You know, they needed to do it this way. All the the bank accounts and the jobs all at the same time. And then make a move. I do know in the high pressure situations that I've been in, I am actually a good leader. I I do react well in the moment. I can manage to stay calm. I wouldn't think that I would be good at it, but I am. Have faith that she's alive. That's not knowing. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, obviously it's a horrible thought, but I can imagine like you being Moira and me being Janine. In that situation, you being like, Rachel, shut up. For fuck's sake, we're not going to find Janine. She's probably dead. Fred, who is played by Joseph Fiennes, who is Brave Fiennes' brother, who played Lord Voldemort. So he says a quote in season one, episode five, which says, better never means better for everyone. It always means worse for some. And that is a quote that I felt was really strong. I just thought it really rang true because he is obviously benefiting from everything in this Gilead society. We all hate Fred. Um, It's important to say, though, he's a villain of the show, yeah, but he justifies everything he does, even to the point where he's in court in Canada defending the fact that he's women, but he's like, this is for the greater good. So he believes that he's not a villain and he's helping. Traditional values are at the core of everything we do here, including trade policy. But he's not putting into perspective the the trauma that these women are going to have to go through to make Gilead beautiful again or whatever the crap he's talking about. I want, this will sound silly, I'd like to play a game with you. Fred is a charismatic, educated man. He's very far right in his beliefs. He's very fundamentalist as a Christian. You know, he is extreme to the extreme ends of the earth. He's thinking about how he can make his society greener, how he can reduce his carbon footprint, increase birth rate, create all of these good things in society, which makes him terrifying. Basically the devil, because you know what people say is that the devil doesn't come at you with like horns. He'll talk to you, have a nice conversation with you. I don't know, he really scares me as a villain because like Voldemort, I'm going to compare him to his brother, Voldemort's just evil. (laughs) Fred is like, I'm helping. That's what scares me. If someone's going to rape you, you don't expect them to give you a cup of coffee first. Even his image, he's very clean cut, he's very well put together. You know that he smells nice. He gives off such a good impression. Right, this is what I don't understand and this is why it's so hypocritical and this is why men suck. The commanders suck, yes. Yeah, in Gilead, that's what I'm talking Gilead. While we're all holier than thou when it comes to our wives, we won't even have sex with our wives and we're going to have sex with our handmaids strictly to produce a child. And then what do they allow? Oh, brothels. I'm like, well then that's very hypocritical. I thought God was always watching. Have you heard of the Madonna Hall complex? Explain it again. <laughs> so... It dates back centuries. It basically reduces women to these one-dimensional. She's either Madonna, which is the Italian word for, you know, the Virgin Mary. She can't be touched. She's above and beyond beautiful, saintly, but very boring and an ag, very wifely. Or a whole meaning she enjoys sex. She's there for a fun time, but not to be taken seriously and not to be respected. And this show uses that with the wives and the handmaids, women who made mistakes in their personal life, you know, cheated or were gay or anything that the Bible condemns. And the Madonna Hall complex is what you've just described. The fact that they have to have this 
ceremonial view around sex, but also they have brothels and they're out to have a fun time on their terms, on the men's terms, not on the women's. It's very annoying. Yeah. Anyway, we have four messages. Oh, right, we're going we're to play them now. You women, since you have got rights, have done nothing, nothing but sleep about, cheat, ruin lives, cause the f- uproar on the rate of suicide men. Eh, uh, what else he has done yet? Oh my god, he's probably started syphilis and all that. <gasps> oh god, it was okay. Fresh. Right, <laughs> so we're going to play the last two and see where this goes. I don't imagine it taking a nice turn, but let's go ahead. Women have a certain name for a certain reason, and that name is Snake with Tubular. <laughs> yeah. Right, I'm not going to have sex with my wife. If I married her and she was a fame with her, and I married her, she should stay a fame with her. Boom, shakalaka. But if she wants to get fat mid-marriage, you know, I might they're not going to change in like fatties all of a sudden. If she's going to get fat, I'm not going to What? It. I'll go Yo. a little nope. down the bar. I'll go with a few bar flies. Nice legs, nice body. Whee. Wife, she's just there for when I... Bye. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, God. You know how I said, I hope these are not from Fred. <laughs> the, you know what really makes it makes me really sad? The Hamid's Tale will have people who watch the show. I mean, I don't think, I don't know if that guy's watched the show, if he's just randomly decided someone's heard him and he's blaming all women for everything. But um, there's going to be people who watch The Hamid's Tale and actually take Fred's side. That's what makes me sad. Because they're going to be like, yeah, women, they're just there to be objects. That was well, really hard to listen yeah. to. As a man, it's sharpened my antennae and awareness. I really feel that um, there's a huge, important conversation that I am only just now, through The Handmaid's Tale, beginning to get a grasp of. And I hope that there are other male viewers that feel the same. You know what we said about Fred being a genuine threat? Because he's yeah. intelligent, charismatic, oh, yeah. <laughs> has point, extra points to make. <laughs> Listening to that made me think that, it's not Fred. you know. <laughs> I'm not bothered by it but it does sometimes make me sad that people actually think like that because the madonna complex is very real when you were talking about it i was like oh yeah that's true anyway okay so you said that you hated nick let's go back to man hating right. considering we're so hate- riled and aggressive about this <laughs> apparently i don't hate nick and this is where me and june differ i feel like and obviously again never been in this situation so can't exactly tell you but i feel like my mind would be get to your daughter and your husband she stops along the way to have this romantic love affair with nick and then when june was like oh to her husband you have to know this baby was born of love i was literally i felt so sorry for her husband born of love all right then i interpreted it as this baby isn't a product of her it's not him he's not the father like don't worry you don't have to put a face to this it's not from brutality and you are Luke Benko you raped my wife well, I didn't think of it I like mean, that I thought she was telling yeah. me she was in love with Nick I was like oh well I just feel sorry for her husband and that's why I don't like Nick if I was in Luke's position I would hate Nick because you're raising somebody else's child there's a lot of reason to feel resentment that's sort of where my emotional um, allegiance is when I watch the show but I well, agree still. that Nick is more of a hindrance than a help a lot of the time well, I just feel I like sometimes he's there just yeah. to get with June, help her not be as tortured. Stop capturing her. First of all, as you know from many a conversation with me, I get incredibly frustrated with June almost getting out three or four <laughs> times and then going right back. Not not just back to Gilead. She always ends up right back to the start. Like She goes straight back to being a handmaid with, to Aunt Lydia. I'm like, oh, for God's sake. But anyway, yeah, Nick. Not a fan. Not a fan of Nick. Okay. I like driving so, Nick. Yes. Yeah, original Nick. Serena. <laughs> she is one of the most hated characters ever. I just hate I hate her more than Laurie from The Walking Dead. And I really Oh, like God, Dead. I hated her. <laughs> so Serena is the wife of Fred, who was like the head, I, I guess like the head of everything. Basically the president of this new land he created it with serena but she didn't get any credit for it because she's a woman a society that has reduced its carbon emissions by 78 percent in three years a society in which women can no longer read your book or anything else 
So she's she can't have kids, but you see like Serena with all her little friends. Oh god, I hate them too. All of our little friends in their blue dresses, like, ooh. She's always one extreme or the other. Serena, she's always the real obstacle and the real antagonist in the story. Or she's actually kind of helping. I understand why June's so frustrated with her, because sometimes Borderline does the right thing. As Mrs. Waterford, you have influence. Access. Power. Up to a point. So move the point. And then right at the last minute goes, no. She had this idea and I had that her and Fred were going to make this whole land and everyone was going to be like, oh. But I don't know. Sometimes I'm like, you helped create this world. Why are you shocked? You have got the same treatment that every other woman gets. And in this land, it doesn't matter how strong and powerful you are. You are a woman. So therefore, you're not a man. And no one's going to listen to you like that. And then she expects Fred to stand up for her. And I'm like... But I kind of get why he doesn't, because that's what she wanted. How can you be angry at him when you helped create this? You're part of the reason that you just got your finger cut off. She's slowly coming to terms with the fact that she's like, oh my God, what have I done? I feel like that's her whole arc. Her whole arc is, what have I done? So this scene where um, Emily and her girlfriend get found out, they're muzzled, they're handcuffed, They're thrown in a van. They're driven somewhere out of the way. The way that that scene is shot, the camera's inside the van. So you see, it's all one shot. The camera's behind Emily. She's in the frame, but you see what she's seeing. She has the put around her neck and the wire lifts. And you see that as the van is driving away. The frame just gets smaller and smaller. And my God, that was so emotional for me. Nobody wants to watch that. It's the struggling for me. That's what freaks me out. Like I've, that's what I've never understood about the olden times. I know there was nothing to do, but when they always used to go and watch public hangings, I'm like, how? When all the handmaids um, again get put into the vans and it almost seems like everyone's going to be hung and they're all crying. Uh, Alma, she actually pees herself when they're all put on the docks and then it's all a mind game. I mean, I thought it was very clever. But in such a twisted way. Oh, here's Anne. <laughs> it was yeah, really, they, really well acted and home. moving. It's kind of like Hamid's Tale is, is a lot like Game of Thrones and The Walking Dead in that no character is safe. When they're all at that meeting and all the commanders are there, they're lined up outside this glass building. And then one handmaid, who I've forgotten her name, but it's June's walking partner after Emily, she just walks in. Tell her to go back. And then she just shows all the girls that she's got this grenade bomb. Go back! You do not see that coming. That scene with the train really, really upset me. Oh God, I know. Be aware that this is a season four spoiler. So if you haven't watch this then you know but go ahead rich the train so i think there's like five of them this is the escape, original game this is escape attempt number twenty five thousand and three or something so they're all in the van they're all on the way to new Polstons or whatever they're doing with aunt lydia and then they all just look at each other and have this like cool women's empowerment kind of this we're out here kind of thing which i, I really like the way women can communicate with a look. I thought it was powerful because I remember a scene in the earlier seasons when they were all in the van and they were all scared. They were all looking down. They didn't know each other yet. They were all on their own. They looked at each other and they all knew, we're not doing this again. And they get out of the van, attack Aunt Lydia, run away. And I was expecting them all to go across the train track and then that to be the thing that kind of allows them to get even further away from the driver and Aunt Lydia. But no. A few of them get run down by this train. And I was like, oh, Aunt Lydia's doing a whole, oh my God, the girls. Mate, you're not a protector of them. You don't protect them in any way. We had the same reaction when that girl, I can't remember her name, but she's this beautiful black girl. She has like a mental breakdown in the supermarket and she picks oh, yeah. the gun off one of the guards. She's losing it. The show continually has this shock factor and it hasn't lost that through the four seasons and i'm really pleased about that because yeah there has sometimes been dead season 
sometimes the writers get into this, they're untouchable, it's never going to happen. But you're right, Aunt Lydia was doing that. No! no! Oh, no! She cares way too much about Janine, though. I don't think she would ever kill Janine. Yeah, she's got a soft spot for Janine. That's the only thing that's I'm ready for Aunt Lydia's character arc, to be honest, because... I just really want her to have this realisation of what have I done? Because you said Serena's had that. You know, when someone is that attached to such a narrow way of looking at the world uh, and repression is the only way to control it, you've got to imagine some damage somewhere. But she loves those girls. She knows that if she does not get that job done, if they don't realise this is what is expected of you and you had better get it, they're not going to survive. I think the challenge for her is that, of course, she becomes attached in a way. But for Aunt Lydia, I don't know, I do see a complexity in her. And you can tell she's thinking about it now, especially since the other aunts are not, like, bowing down or anymore. She's not like the head aunt anymore. Yeah, when she was on the treadmill, which I was like, what? <laughs> What's mm -hmm. going on? <laughs> the treadmill really annoyed me. They don't have any kitchen appliances, right? There's no toasters, no kettles, none of that. They boil them water by pans and all that crap. Treadmill's a very modern thing. And you would expect them to just be running around a yard or something. They're all for this, you know, back to basics mentality. But does that show that behind closed doors, they're really not as committed to the cause as they think they are? Probably. I feel really sorry for that because he's in an impossible situation. He's obviously never going to stop thinking about his daughter. And he has no, he's had no contact with her since they left. Obviously, I'm not saying I feel more sorry for him than for June. They're in, but they're both in very difficult, different he might not have been, like, getting physically abused, but he's trapped inside his own head. He's like, I've got no idea where my family are. Oh, baby, I, I miss you. I think about you every day. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Don't. I, I... Don't be sorry. I, no, I should have tried harder to find you. You can tell he just he feels so helpless. And I feel really sorry for him. I feel sorry for him. He's just, like, eating dinner, and you can see on his face that he's like, I don't know what to say about anything. I think, you know, going back to that awful set of messages that we had, when that person mentioned about, you know, women causing men's suicide and all of that, you know, society causes that problem, which is horrendous. But Luke does a very honest job at portraying men's mental health in a situation where he hasn't been there. He hasn't been allowed to help her and he can't take that away. The Hammer's Tale proves that it's society that causes divisions and complications between men and women as June and Luke are now facing they didn't have a problematic marriage before but now June has come back with all this trauma and Luke can't take it away so how do you move forward and you can that? see it's going to be you tough can, to navigate and you could see he's like do I mention it do I not see anything do I ignore it do I talk about it like what do I do and I'm like I feel really sorry for him because I don't think June knows what to do either because if I was her I'd be like I don't know what you need to do because I'm just, this is just how I am now. That would take so much time to process. He still feels like he's married to his wife like he did before, and she's like a completely different person. Kelly had to change her. I've changed her. I said that from the beginning though I called it I said that's going to be a very hard situation to navigate yeah she's not even in the right mind space to heal yet she's in pure anger pure revenge so you can't help someone who doesn't want to be helped and that's the top and bottom of it you know Luke can't help her yet because she doesn't she's she's too angry to be helped she doesn't he want wants, to heal yet he's just like let's live our lives and then I feel like June thinks that that's wrong to just like go well I'm out now so it's not my problem anymore. You know what I mean? But I, I don't think Luke's being that harsh. He's just saying, let's live our lives now because you're back and, you know. Whatever happened there, that is on them. That is not on you. Where do you see the show going in season five? I'm interested in finding out Serena's reaction to the big thing that happened at the end of season four. We saw that she was sent a letter informing her of said thing. I feel like she's going to be relieved, sort of, inwardly. I don't understand what's going to happen with June. Right. And like I said, I'm really keen for Aunt Lydia to have a character arc where she thinks, am I doing the right thing? I feel like there's got to be a tipping point where it's too far for her. I would love to see 
an episode from Hannah's perspective where it's just from the beginning what's happened all of the little bits in between where she meets her at the house and all that stuff like how she got there from her perspective I think that would be really oh interesting my God. To see. it would be strange to see the handmaid's tale from a different person's point of view other well than that's Jim. what I mean that's a good idea though, if we had Hannah. that episode with Hannah yeah yeah because she would view people different to how June would view them because June views them as kidnappers and taking their child off her. Hannah knows them as the people who've raised her Yes, we should. I think that's a good stopping place. And I just want to yes. say, you know, the actual point of The Handmaid's Tale is not to cause divides. It's to show that you can come together despite divides. And that message from that earlier listener really, really annoyed me, actually. The more that I've sat with it, the more it's festering. That is funny because at the start of the podcast, we compared ourselves to which Handmaid's Tale character would be. And we said, you like to think about it first and then react and I react first and think yes, about it later. Exactly. and that is exactly what we did so that is a perfect way to wrap it up because we've just shown exactly who we'd be <laughs> so you're Janine and I'm Moira <laughs> thank you very much for everyone for listening and our Instagram is two artists talk as in the number two bye bye